from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program, featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Give us a call. Join the national conversation. We're late night, we're live, we're national, and our phone number is 833-482-5337, 833-4VALDEZ. This is your chance to be heard. Looking forward to speaking with you. And there's a bunch that I want to get in uh, before we get into our conversation on the border. Uh, there's a bunch of domestic stuff that's happening today. Uh, one of those heavy news days, which I love. This gives us a lot to talk about, lots to dish on. But um, today there was a few things. First of all, is Hunter Biden going to be charged, right? Uh, there's uh, there's some news out that says that the Department of Justice is getting very close to making a charging decision. I don't know if that's, um, that's a good thing, a bad thing. Honestly, I think his dad would probably just pardon him anyway. So I don't know you know, the validity of it, but it could mess up the campaign a little bit, uh, you know, exposing a lot of the criminality of the Biden family. And uh, this Biden bribery scheme seems to be taking shape now. You've got Congress now announcing that they are um, going to be investigating some stuff because there's a whistleblower saying that there's several whistleblowers that are saying that there is a, a high degree of criminality dating back to when Biden was vice president. Uh, other news internationally. Was the Kremlin attacked earlier? Did they try to kill Putin? And by they, I mean Zelensky and the Ukrainians. We don't have the answers, but there's a report from Fox News on that. We're going to get to that momentarily as well. Now, I want to start with uh, Chuck Grassley's statement today, because again, Grassley's not one of these hyper-partisan types. He typically uh, is is one of those that is happy to buck the system, tries to take his job seriously. I think he's the oldest member of Congress, and he's... um, typically uh, viewed as a pretty serious guy. And uh, he had some words about this situation with Biden and FBI records that alleged that there is a bribery scheme where Joe Biden was accepting money in in exchange for promoting certain policy positions as vice president. Listen to this. A highly credible whistleblower is alleging that the Department of Justice has evidence that the president of the United States, Joe Biden, was directly involved in a criminal scheme with a foreign national. We're being told that justice has had in their possession a document showing Biden directly exchanged money for policy decisions when he was vice president. Again, a foreign national bribed Vice President Biden in exchange for policy decisions. This isn't just cracked out, Hunter. This is a direct link to the president of the United States. Senator Chuck Grassley, who broke the news, says these allegations are very credible. Listen. We have credible information that this uh, possible uh, criminal activity took place. I do have uh, faith in the whistleblowers that bring it to me that this document exists. Uh, We have a rough idea of what's in the document from the uh, credible uh, whistleblower we get this information, the document exists, and we'll have to get the document. This is Grassley's wheelhouse. He doesn't mess around when it comes to whistleblowers. Grassley's the real deal on this stuff. And that's bad All news right. for Biden. Well, we'll pause that right there. And uh, that's the news uh, from Chuck Grassley coming out of Congress on this subpoena that was issued following the legally protected disclosures to the office of Senator Chuck Grassley and uh, the... Um, House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer. So interesting uh, to see how this is going to play out. But the document was described as an FD 1023 form generated by the FBI that allegedly details an arraignment, excuse me, an arrangement involving an exchange of money for policy decisions. Comer said that the information provided by a whistleblower raises concerns that then Vice President Biden allegedly engaged in this bribery scheme with this uh, alleged uh, foreign national saying, we believe the FBI possesses an unclassified internal document that includes very serious and detailed allegations implicating the current president of the United States. 
big deal. This is a big deal, right? This is uh, not the Congress. This is the United States Senate, which typically won't touch these things uh, if they don't feel that there's any merit to it. If it's not meritorious, they say no thanks. So that's the, a huge story that's developing, and we're going to get to the bottom of that tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and as it, you know, as it continues to unfold, uh, but uh, Grassley continued saying that the American people need to know if the president sold out the United States of America to make money for himself. Now, this is, I think, a pretty big deal because Chuck Grassley might be a lot of things, but he's not a um, a bomb throwing uh, hardcore conservative. Right. <laughs> he's never been that. And so for him to make allegations like this lead me to believe that this is some pretty credible stuff and that he's already thrown this by his friend, the turtle in chief, Merch McConnell, eh, uh, um, uh, Senate minority leader. And and he thinks that they're going to get somewhere with this. Um, I've been saying this for quite a while that I find it so difficult to understand why Biden makes these decisions. And while it's fun to make fun of him and his age and his how aloof he is and how how uh, slow he is. It doesn't change the fact that the muscle memory in him is that of a corrupt machine politician. And I feel like he knows exactly what's going on. This is what he's done his entire 47, 50 years, whatever it is, in Congress. Biden has been a corrupt politician his entire career. Remember, he ran for president and he had to withdraw his campaign. Why? Because he lied. (laughs) Because he plagiarized the speech. So it doesn't help that in addition to all of that, We've got this Department of Justice saying they're closer to making a decision in charging Hunter Biden. The um, U.S. attorney, David Weiss of Delaware, told this to The Washington Post and says they are near the final decisions on gun and tax crimes. According to The New York Post, he's been under investigation since 2018. The news comes one week after Biden's lawyers reportedly met with prosecutors to get an update on the case. And this was uh, probably to negotiate between Biden's lawyers and the prosecutors before a charging decision is made. Biden is being investigated uh, for the last several years on tax crimes and the the, the, uh, charge that he lied in order to get uh, a pistol permit. Nothing wrong with having a pistol, something wrong with lying, saying that you're not hooked on drugs and then going on TV and saying you were hooked on drugs. So, and writing about it. So the meeting that took place in DC last week is one that we talked about on the show and it's typical of of happening towards the end of a case when they're about to conclude whether they're going to bring charges or not. The New York Post says that uh, they're poised to announce whether the attorney, the uh, United States attorney for Delaware, uh, is poised to announce whether there'll be an indictment on felony or misdemeanor tax charges and lying on a federal gun purchase form. So we're going to see what happens there. Now, Uh, I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. I do know that I can't see a scenario where Hunter Biden isn't pardoned by President Biden. I just don't see it. I think if you have that power, you use that power, right? They use it all the time. Uh, Obama pardoned the um, Oscar Lopez Rivera, right? Puerto Rican nationalist who was a terrorist that was uh, complicit in the bombing of several federal buildings. So they do this all the time. They don't care how serious or egregious the crime was. That they um, they're happy to do what they do. So we're going to see what happens with that one, because that's a pretty interesting uh, scenario as well. And then there's a a report on whether or not there if it's real or not. We don't know on whether a drone struck the Kremlin and if it was launched by Zelensky and the Ukrainians. Uh, I saw the video. We have a report from Fox News. We're going to get to that in a little bit before the uh, top of the next hour. But first, I want to bring in Mark Morgan. Uh, former Obama border chief to talk about the latest on the border. And we're going to do that straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Rich Valdez, who again will do a fine job, and I know you'll enjoy listening to it. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. And on MSNBC earlier today, General Barry McCaffrey was commenting on sending 1,500 troops to the border, how the Biden administration is trying to uh, alleviate some of the problems that they've caused. (laughs) 
<laughs> with uh, sending uh, active duty troops there to do administrative menial tasks. And uh, General McCaffrey, who um, uh, quite frankly just said that this is nothing more than a tiny gesture and uh, thinking that Title 42 gives him a green flag to request asylum and then getting a hearing a year or so later, uh, 15 troop, 1,500 troops being deployed are a tiny gesture with that regard. We're talking about a buildup of 90,000 people over the last 10 days and way more to come straight ahead. So to get to the bottom of everything, um, friend of the program, visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation, former acting commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection under the Trump administration, uh, was also the border chief under the Obama administration. Mark Morgan is with us. Mark Morgan, welcome, sir. Rich, thanks for having me as always. Great being on with you. Thank you, brother. And uh, let, let's talk about this because, you know, it's interesting how, you know, Trump always talked about we should send the military, we should send the military. And they went, oh, you're a fascist, you're this, you're that, and you're everything else. And now uh, Biden says, hey, we're sending in over 1,000 troops down there. We've already got 2,500 troops down there. And it seems to be applauded. I think it's uh, uh, election related. So he could say that he did something at the border uh, in addition with the parole that we talked about last time where it's you know making it look like something's happening, but nothing's really happening to try to fudge the numbers a little bit. But that's just my suspicious take on things. What say you? So I, I'm kind of half with, halfway with you, Rich, and here's why I say. I, I think the, the mainstream media continues to cover for them. The, uh, you know, the Democratic Party and open border advocates are plotting it because they know the actual truth. And the truth is the 1,500 troops going down there will do nothing to secure the border. It will do nothing to regain the strategy that we had that, that acted as a deterrent to those trying to illegally enter a consequence to those that do and put integrity back in the system by reducing fraudulent claims being filed. It's not going to do anything to stem the flow. It won't do anything to get more resources back doing their law enforcement duties. All it's going to do is help the border troll and it's new found admission by Secretary Mayorkas, which is to be nothing more than a profiting enterprise. Rich, that's it. These troops are just going to go down there because they know the numbers. Look, the numbers have already been at catastrophic numbers for two years. They know when Title 42 ends, it's going to turn the hurricane into a temporary tsunami. And so they know they need additional personnel to continue to process, catch, and release illegal aliens into the interior United States at the same pace and efficiency that they have been. That's the only reason that those troops are going down there. And now Mark Morgan, again, for the benefit of the audience, anybody who's tuning in right now, we're on with Mark Morgan for uh, CBP chief. And I wanted to um, just reiterate that uh, uh, Title 42 is a health exception. Tell us a little bit about it. Yep. Yeah. And so there's still a fundamental misunderstanding. And, and the irony, too, is because it's this administration that hasn't actually been applying Title 42 correctly. Title 42 is a public health order. And the CDC at this time owns that. And we ask, and, and, and the CDC under Trump administration, at the height of COVID, instituted Title 42. And it was designed to prevent the further introduction and spread of a global infectious disease in the United States. We implemented it in March of 2020. It was the right thing to do. In my opinion, it saved countless American lives. What the Biden administration did on day one, even though when they took over, we were still in the middle of a global pandemic, they started carving out exceptions for Title 42. And so fast forward now, the past probably 18 months, Rich, they haven't been applying 42 correctly. They've really been applying it as a immigration tool rather than what it was intended to do, a public health tool. And so that's why I mean right now when Title 42 goes, they're just going to shift from Title 42 to what we call Title 8, which is the traditional uh, immigration law that it falls under. And uh, we're not going to see anything different. We're still going to see a massive influx of illegal aliens. We're not going to see any deterrence. We're not going to see any consequences. We're not going to see any integrity back in the system or reduce fraudulent claims. Again, the military is just going to be there to help facilitate and make sure they're able to re release uh, as, as, as fast as humanly possible. Now, Mark Morgan, you having you know been on the ground and have a tremendous amount of experience with this stuff, when uh, they say they're sending 1,500 active duty troops to the southern border to help with administrative duties and whatnot so that they could free up these border agents from being travel agents to actually being border agents again, uh, how much of that is actually going to happen based on your expertise and what you've seen at the border? 
Zero. It's a lie. It, it's, it's, look, this administration, it, it's, it's unfathomable to me. I, I get all, all the time, obviously, to talk about the border. But I got to tell you, it, it's not only frustrating that from day one, they intentionally created the crisis. They intentionally dismantled a network of tools, authorities, and policies we had in place, like, like the safe third countries with all three Northern Triangle countries, gone. The wall system, gone. The Romanian Mexico program, gone. The leverage we had where Mexico had 20,000 personnel securing their uh, interior enforcement and border security, gone. Uh, ICE's ability to conduct interior enforcement to deport and remove criminal illegal aliens from the streets in our cities, gone. So it's not just they did all that and created the worst crisis, but they're lying to the American people. Rich, every single day, whether it's whether it's the secretary saying our borders are secure, which is a lie, or the press secretary saying that we reduced illegal immigration by 90 percent, which is a whopper of a lie. She's full of crap. <laughs> it's unbelievable, right? And now I don't know where thing. they come up with this stuff. I mean, either. Well, well, exactly. It's, it's to, again, it's to it's to make sure that the American people don't really see what they're seeing. And this is the same thing. Fifteen hundred military. The one thing that I will agree with the general is a tiny gesture. That's exactly what it is. And so it's all it's going to do is actually assist with the increase so that Border Patrol can maintain its proficiency at catch and releasing. It is not, I promise you, it is not going to result in more agents on the line doing their job of border enforcement. That's the opposite of what's going to happen. So uh, in, in some, it sounds like this is a uh, theater, right? Saying, hey, we're sending over a thousand troops down there. I'm Joe Biden. I'm doing a great job. It's an election year. Uh, vote for me. We're doing a good thing. Uh, this is fodder for the media. This is fodder for those who yep. aren't paying attention just to say, hey, look, we're doing stuff. That's right. That's exactly right, Rich. I, I think I could have said it better myself. It's all pretend. It's all make believe. It's all a lie to say, hey, look what we're doing. It's just like the CBP one app. Right. And that's where Jean Pierre oh, got her claim of of 90 percent. Right. We CBP one app for, for people. Little listen. Right. So what, what they've done is. It's a perversion of the law. They, they've legalized otherwise illegal activity, and this is what I mean. What they've told uh, 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 migrants from 171 countries – oh, by the way, there's only about 195 recognized countries in the world. Well, we've uh, apprehended illegal aliens in the past 25 months from 171 of those countries. And so what they've told the entire world, hey, hey, look, here's the deal, folks. Do us a favor. Stop illegally entering between the ports of entry and file fraudulent claims where we're releasing you in the United States. If you stop doing that, we'll let you come to a lawful port of entry where we'll continue to look the other way as you file knowingly fraudulent claims and we'll still process and release the United States. And that would be our little secret. And then we'll call it a legal pathway. It's BS. It's a perversion of the law. It's a lie. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of American people don't understand what's happening. Yeah, and this is a big one uh, because I think between the yep. app and the parole system and, and, and a lot of this um, trickery, it, it's difficult for people who are trying to put food on their table and paying a lot more for that food, by the way, and a lot more for their gas and a lot more for everything and uh, trying to keep up when, when they're bombarded with news saying, oh, there's more troops, there's this, it's down 90%. People are like, oh, man, things are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and the whole thing is a lie. Mark Morgan, stick with us. The music means they're kicking both of us out of here for a minute to pay the bills, but we're going to come right back. Mark Morgan is our guest, visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation, former acting commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And our phone number, if you have a question or a comment, give us a call, 833-4-VALDEZ, 833-482-5337. Straight ahead, I want to talk about what's going on with this guy that shot his neighbors and what that means for immigration in America. Don't go anywhere. to describe Jim with words so I want to walk so you can walk with me and just see the magnitude of the number of individuals who are around this church here just just streets from downtown El Paso. A lot of these individuals you'll see are males, adult males. A lot of the women with children are actually in shelters and a network of shelters throughout El Paso. As you mentioned, the city of El Paso under a state of emergency, they declared a disaster 
here uh, because of the influx, because they know that once Title 42 lifts, that there is going to be a greater influx of migrants. But here's the thing. So process this with me. Title 42 allows immigration agents to swiftly return migrants back to Mexico. So the obvious question as you look around is then why are there so many migrants if the federal government is actually implementing this Title 42? Then why are there so many migrants out here? Well, here's what we know. From talking to migrants and community leaders and officials on both sides of the border, I can tell you that thousands of migrants, nearly 40,000, are in at least four northern Mexican cities and frustration is boiling over. A lot of them are deciding to cross the border. That's why you see so many out here. Some of them are turning themselves in to border authorities, Jim. Others are deciding to cross the border illegally because they've lost patience. All right, so that is Rosa Flores. She's a CNN correspondent on CNN, if you'll believe that report there, uh, with Jim Acosta. And uh, she's telling it like it is. I mean, I think it's hard to escape the truth. Uh, Our guest, Mark Morgan, visiting fellow at the Federation for American Immigration Reform. Mark Morgan, uh, when you hear a report like this, when even CNN is not providing cover anymore, uh, what's your initial reaction? Well, first of all, say welcome to the party, right? So where, (laughs) where have they been for the past two years? I mean, we know where they've been for the past two years. They've been acting as an extension of the Democratic Party in this White House. Look, 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 look. And this is not a political state for me. This is obvious. Let's just speak the truth here. They've covered for this administration. They've allowed the administration to lie and lie. Again, another example is when the White House Secretary Secretary said a 90 percent reduction. Not a single person in the mainstream media called her out on it. Not a single person. They let her get away with it. They just went on to the next softball question. And and so uh, so why I welcome even the mainstream media now waking up and joining the party. But but look. A lot of what she said was just inaccurate. She, it's clearly because they haven't been paying attention. They really don't know what they're talking about. Uh, there's so many holes in what she said with respect to Title 42, with respect to what people are actually doing. Mark my words. People are entering the border illegally, meaning in between the ports of entry every single day, and turning themselves in, as well as the gotaways. So, so th- that's why I keep saying for a long time, Rich, this administration is treating the entire border as one big port of entry because it doesn't matter whether you enter illegally and file a fraudulent claim or you come up to a lawful port of entry and file a fraudulent claim. You are treated exactly the same. You are processed and released into the interior United States unless that, that small group is removed under Title 42. And what she doesn't understand, because they haven't been paying attention, is once Title 42 goes away, again, they're going to go back to Title 8. And there's something that's called expedited removal under uh, Title 8. That's where that's what they're going to start using. But for the majority, that, that Title 8, the expedited removal, is only going to be, for the most part, used against Mexican single adults. So the remaining individuals from 171 countries – are still going to be processed and released in the United States and never to be heard from again. That's why you're wow. going to see this. It's not. It's not going to stop. You're you're going to see this this hurricane, this tsunami spike that is probably going to level off to the catastrophic numbers that it's been. Uh, but look, right now, even before Title 42 and Rich, we're already at uh, uh, over 8,000 a day right now. 8,000 a day. Now, Mark Morgan, when we look at numbers like this, are the the is the the chief number of individuals coming in, are they Mexican nationals or is it just people passing through Mexico from all over the place? So this is another great question, Rich, and I know you know this, and, and, and I think it's important, though, you ask a question for, for your listeners is, no, it's not. It, it, it's actually m- more people are illegally entering or coming up to our borders and filing, filing fraudulent claims from other countries. That's mm-hmm. this big misnomer, right? That, oh, well, it's, it's mainly people from Mexico or, or, or the, the, the Northern Triangle countries. No. Again, 171 different countries from Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Iraq, uh, 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 Russia, China, you name it. We could keep going on 171 different countries. And Rich, this is why we say, besides the fact that drugs are pouring across the open border and criminal aliens are pouring across our border, it's also a national security threat. We also know in the past 25 months, Border Patrol have apprehended more illegal aliens on the FBI's terror screening database than any other time in our nation's history. And then we go to the 1.4 million known gotaways. 
Think about it. Think about how many criminals are among the 1.4 million known gotaways, and think about how many potential illegal aliens on the FBI's terror screening database. Literally, we could have the next terror sleeper cell in the United States planning the next large-scale attack. And Rich, we would have no idea because 1.4 million gotaways. Unbelievable. And we don't really have to go that far, right? I mean, if we look at just today, you had the announcement from the um, the sheriff um, uh, announcing yep. that there's more arrests. This guy who killed four people, five people, um, that, I guess that qualifies as a mass shooting. Th- this guy had been deported five times and he was not five a known times. terrorist or anything like that. This guy is just a criminal person who's here in yep. the country illegally and, and just goes to show you that... If that border isn't open, I don't know what it is. And I don't even like using this term open border because I think it, it sends the idea that, you know, it's we're, we're just letting everybody. And I know we're trying to send some people back home. But clearly, if you've been deported five times and you're back again, it's not that hard to get in. That's right. And what I like, so I'm, I'm kind of with you. I like to say our border is unsecure, right? It, yeah. it, it is. I mean, we went from the most secure border to an intentionally unsecure border. And you're absolutely right. First of all, I have to give a shout out to to uh, uh, Border Patrol's it's SOG, their Special Operations Group out of El Paso, mm-hmm. their BORTAC folks, as well as the Laredo SOD, their, their BORTAC detachment there. They're, they played a, a significant role in, in the capture of the scumbag. But, but your, your point is very mm-hmm. valid. Think, think about this, is that, that under, under this secretary, and this is why I, I want to be very clear, and I want to own this. I believe that, that the secretary and this, and this administration, the president, the, the, the blood of these five innocent victims are on their hands. And here's why. It, it, and a lot of people go, oh, Mark, you're being hyperbolic, and, and I respectfully disagree. This is a secretary that said being in the country illegally is not enough to remove you. And that's, that's a perversion and a, a contradiction of the law. Again, being in the country illegal is not enough to deport you. So, so he has directed – that incredible women, men and women I, that, that want to do their job, he has told them that individuals like this are not a priority. Multiple entries, which, by the way, is a felony, a multiple re-entries. And think about this. We know that law enforcement came to this guy's house more than once. And so he's in the country illegally with a firearm. That's illegal as well. But yet we're, we're in a place now where, where local law enforcement aren't asking if you're here illegally. Uh, uh, local communities are telling them refuse to, to let them to work with ICE. But even if they had called ICE under Secretary Mayorkas, they would have said, nope, our secretary says not a priority. Go ahead and let him be here illegally and have firearms shooting in his yard. Yeah, and I, I think it's absolutely crazy. And apparently, you know, we were taking bets off the air with the production crew saying this guy's got to be halfway through Mexico. Lord knows where he's going uh, because, you know, had so many days had passed. And then uh, at the press conference earlier today, Lieutenant Timothy Kane, San Jacinto County Sheriff's Office, he says uh, that they've arrested four more individuals, apparently people in his family, people that lived with him, that were uh, helping this guy to uh, yep. abscond. And uh, I mean, I, I listen, I get it. I get it. This is criminal behavior and that's how criminals operate. Uh, but the um, th- this I think not enough of a big deal is being made about this. I think people really need to understand that this is not an isolated thing. Th- these things are happening on a regular basis. Maybe not five people getting yep. murdered like this, but it needs to be um, noted. Yeah, which I, I couldn't agree more. First of all, I can't. The people that aid and bedded him. It's about time that those that assist violent criminal scumbags like this guy that they go to prison for a very long time this guy executed five people including a kid i mean literally in the head execution style anybody that aided and abetted this guy should go down with him and should be in jail for a very long time number two I, I, he, I, this is a very important stat because we, we talk a lot, Rich, about the drugs coming through our unsecure border. We've talked about oh, the yeah. national security threats from 171 countries, but criminals. From 2011 to 2022, 261,000 criminal illegal aliens committed 433,000 crimes, including 800 homicides, 800 kidnappings, and over 5,000 assaults. And here's what the mic drop wow. is. That's the state of Texas only. Wow. Holy crap. 
<laughs> it yep. just makes me think when you say that, you know, these people were aiding and abetting these people. What about every single governor and mayor that's declared a sanctuary state or a sanctuary city? They're yeah. aiding and abetting these people all along. We should lock them up, too. No, our, our, I completely agree. Our government is. And there was a, a, a whistleblower that came out talking about the unencumbered minors. And she's spot on. She's my new hero. She, she said basically that that our federal government now is conspiring with the cartels to participate in the world's largest human smuggling traffic operation we've ever seen. It's absolutely mm-hmm. right. And look, to go back to the victims, to, to, to put it in perspective, in our country, Rich, we actually have an association. It's called the Advocates for Victims of Illegal Alien Crime. To mm-hmm. show you how, how, how widespread this is, we could spend the next four hours giving specific examples of, of the 22-year-old young woman who had a whole life ahead of her that was savagely raped, beaten, strangled to death by an illegal alien. Or the, the single mother who was stabbed in the neck and head 58 times by an illegal alien. Or the cop that was shot by an illegal alien. Or the, uh, the, the grandmother uh, and, and granddaughter who was killed by a smuggler in a horrific car crash. I mean, Chris, we could go on and on. This is not just a one-off thing. There are not yeah. only Americans dying every single day from drugs, but they're dying <clears throat> from the criminals that are part of the millions of gotaways coming in. Hundred uh, percent, so true. And it, it seems like we've been talking about this for year upon year, and we're not making the progress we ought to be making. Folks, we're on with Mark Morgan, visiting fellow at the Federation for American Immigration Reform, FairUS dot org. He's with us for another segment, and I want to get his take on this record-breaking dark net fentanyl bust that uh, was huge, or as Trump would say, huge. So keep it locked right there. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. We have a call from Manila, Philippines. Gil, who wants to make a comment to our guest, Mark Morgan. Uh, He was the head of Customs and Border Patrol. Gil, welcome. Okay, two two quick things. Uh, before I came here uh, to the Philippines, I actually worked as a staffer for uh, Congressman Reyes, who preceded Virgil O'Rourke. I'm sure you know his history. He was the uh, uh, section uh, chief of the Border Patrol before he got into Congress. And uh, so I'm pretty aware of what's going on. I've been in El Paso for a long time. Uh, but your uh, man there, uh, Professor Victor Davis Hansen at the Heritage Foundation, can mm-hmm. tell how uh, California used illegal immigration to turn California from a red state to a blue state. And I guess that's I wanted, all I wanted to say tonight. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Gil. I appreciate it. Mark Morgan? Yeah. Yeah. So I tell you, he, he's, he's absolutely right. And, and I, I, I actually, to be honest, I didn't want to admit this. I, I've been a career official. I've served this country for almost 40 years, served under six administrations, both Republican and Democrat. This is not a red or blue issue for me. This is red, white and blue. But we also have to face the facts. And, and what's happening at our border, it's because it's been intentionally unsecured. What he says, I think he's right, because nothing else makes sense that they see a perceived political benefit. And there's two ways. One is a, a redistricting, because remember, illegal aliens are counted as part of the census. So they see a real redistricting in favor of Democrats. Right, political it's a real, real, Exactly. The second one is for every single illegal alien – that they find a pathway to citizenship, they believe it's going to equate to Democratic vote. I think they're right. I think Gil is absolutely correct. Yeah. Now, Mark Morgan, I want you to listen to Merrick Garland very briefly announcing um, this new feather in his cap for this Operation Darknet. Check this out. In the United States, we arrested 153 defendants, seized 104 illegal guns, and seized over 200,000 pills, including those containing fentanyl. What's up with this? Um, I mean, thank God we're doing something. Uh, is it enough? No, it's not. And here, here's we've learned nothing. And this is what gets me frustrated. So I was in the FBI when 9-11 happened. 
I, I, I was on uh, at Ground Zero in New York. I, I deployed there for a short time. I was also at the Pentagon, and, and, and I was at, at FBI headquarters as we became this, began this massive investigation. Here's the one thing, Rich, that we learned as a nation, that we cannot be a reactive law enforcement agency only. And that's what we were across the nation. All law enforcement, whether it's state, federal, local, we were reactive in nature. What 9-11 taught us is that is a failed strategy. We have to always be that. There will always be some form of reactive. But we have to be a preventative, proactive approach. We have to be a threat-based, intelligence-driven, operationally focused. What this is, it's more smoke and mirrors, right? It, we're, we're just getting better at reacting instead of proactively preventing. And how do we do that? Secure the damn borders and stop the drugs from coming in. Let's do that. Let's stop the drugs from getting here. Let's not just react once the drugs have already gotten here. It's kind of like their approach on trafficking. Rather than stop the flow of illegal aliens, rather than stop the, the, the migrants from being trafficked, they are just say they're going to get real tough after they've been trafficked. It's stupid. It's reckless. It's irresponsible. And it's not addressing the true problem. Gil, thank you for your call. Mark Morgan, uh, I want to thank you for everything that you've shared with us tonight. I think you're 100 percent right. Stop the drugs, stop the trafficking, close the border and secure it. And and that's the only way. I don't know how we get there, but uh, we need people like you out there to keep beating the drum and and calling uh, you know a duck a duck, because otherwise we're going to be lost in this fight. Mark Morgan, thanks for being with us tonight. Rich, thanks for having me. Appreciate it, brother. You bet. God bless. God bless. And uh, straight ahead, we're going to talk about this attack on the Kremlin. Is it real? Is it a fake, phony, fraud, false flag? I don't know. I'm going to make up my mind when we come back. We're going to hear a report from Fox News on the attack on the Kremlin. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Russia is accusing Ukraine of attacking the Kremlin with two drones overnight. Uh, they believe they were intended to take out Vladimir Putin. The Kremlin says he was not there at the time. Uh, Moscow says it's a terrorist attack and that Russian military and security forces disabled the drones before they could strike. One of the drones apparently hit a flagpole. Mm -hmm. So if that's how you disabled them, I'm not sure. But the video was shot from across the Moscow River uh, from the walls of the Kremlin. All right, that's a report from uh, the Fox News Channel uh, earlier this evening on the attack on the Kremlin, the attempted assassination of Vladimir Putin. That's a breaking news story. And um, again, anything is possible, right? I mean, this this is um, not the first time we've seen attacks on things that, you know, you, you kind of jaw dropping. And you're like, no way, that didn't really happen. But it seems it did. Um I don't know. I honestly don't know if it's if it's legit. If it's not legit, I can tell you that the Biden administration, uh, you have some officials that have come out saying that they had no advanced warning of Ukraine's alleged uh, assassination attempt on Putin. And following the uh, alleged assassination attempt on uh, Vladimir Putin, the uh, administration officials that uh, aren't saying who they are, um, say they had no warning of the drone attack on the Kremlin, at least not ahead of time. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken told the Washington Post's David Ignatius on Wednesday, that was earlier today, that he was taking comments from the Kremlin with a large shaker of salt. <laughs> so it's funny. You see, I don't like to believe anything Blinken says. I think he's a fake phony fraud. But um, when it comes to, you know, Putin being a fake phony fraud, I think we agree on that. I can't believe anything coming out of the Kremlin. So we'll see what happens. Um, if I were Zelensky, I'd say, you're damn right it was me. Watch out, because next time we're going to get you. But that would just be me, right, being a little bit petty. Anyway, uh, we have uh, a story coming up with Alex McFarland. We're going to talk about a list of dissenting opinions uh, coming out of Minnesota. That's a pretty crazy story. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Live from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Make sure you chime in online. Let us know what's going on in your neck of the woods and how you're listening to the show. I'd love to hear that as well. And if you want to join the show, you're welcome to call. We're going to be taking calls this hour on uh, the topics we're discussing. Uh, The phone number, 833-482-5337-833, the number four, Valdez. We are live. We are national. It's live late night radio. And uh, happy to be here with you. There's some headlines I want to go over very quickly. Uh, breaking news uh, uh, throughout the day. You've probably heard about uh, the shooting in Atlanta at a hospital. And we have a clip from the police chief. Listen to this. At 12.08 this afternoon, we were called just down the street to 1110 West Peace Street. This is a medical facility of the Northside Hospital that is at that location. This shooting did occur inside the waiting room of that medical facility uh, where five individuals were shot. Unfortunately, a a 39-year-old female has lost her life. And of of those that are injured is a 71-year-old female, a 56-year-old female, a 39-year-old female, and then a 25-year-old female. We do know that Patterson, Mr. Patterson, our suspect, left the building. Uh, We believe he carjacked a vehicle a short distance away and was able to flee the scene as the law enforcement agencies were descending on this area. All right. Well, this Atlanta shooting suspect was captured after... uh, Uh, several hours of a manhunt in Cobb County and killing, uh, of course, that one woman and injuring four others. The uh, suspected gunman is in custody after the whole active shooter scenario, and um, and that's according to the Atlanta Police Department. The shooting occurred, as the chief mentioned earlier today, and uh, this guy is now in custody. They have some video of him. He was caught on camera, and they were able to catch him. He had a mask on during the shooting, but apparently when he got on the elevator to make his getaway, he took the mask off and they had that surveillance video. Uh, so I'll, I'll share this article so you can see it. There's a mug shot of him, his booking photo. I got to tell you, it looks, he looks extremely serene um, in, in this picture. Anyway, his name is uh, Dion Patterson. Uh, 24 years old, and uh, the public has been advised to call 911. Um, if they saw him, they were able to get him, and they don't know why he shot this woman. According to the chief, the suspect uh, carjacked that vehicle, and uh, they were able to get him a little bit while later. So, again, update on that. The suspect's been caught, and, uh, you know, just horrible, horrible thing. Um, you know, I, I think about people that are 39 are usually in the middle of of their lives, right? It's a, it's a terrible time. It's a terrible time when when things like this are happening. But that's that story. Then we also have uh, other news uh, coming from, let's see where this one's coming from. This is from Minnesota uh, because um, apparently there's a bill coming out of Minnesota that says if you argue that COVID came from China, this could land you on Minnesota's government bias registry. And that's according to a new bill. Uh, Minnesota State Representative Harry Niska uh, was uh, discussing this. He was sparring over the proposal at a recent uh, hearing. Listen to this. If a, a Minnesotan writes an article uh, claiming or arguing that COVID-19 is a Chinese bioweapon that w- leaked from, the, from a lab in Wuhan, and someone reports that article to the Department of Human Rights, is that something that the Department of Human Rights should put in their uh, bias registry under your bill? Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Niska, uh, you know, not all incidents uh, are considered, I guess, violent or um, criminal, as I said before. And so this clearly, if with the rhetoric that we have seen since the pandemic and uh, regarding um, accusing Asians of bringing in the coronavirus, uh, that uh, is bias motivated. And so that can be considered uh, a bias incident. Representative Niska. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think I heard uh, yes to that, um, a yes to that, which is very troubling to me, um, that, that someone uh, making a, a factual argument uh, along those lines, I think is something that's within uh, political discourse would be uh, included in the Department of Human Rights database. Let me ask you another question, though, if Representative Vang would yield. She will yield, Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Vang, if, uh, if uh, a Minnesotan is wearing a T-shirt uh, that says, I love J.K. Rowling, and someone sees that and reports them to the Minnesota Department of Human Rights uh, as, an, as an example of uh, gender identity or gender expression bias, is that something that the Minnesota Department of Human Rights should put in this, uh, in this uh, bias database? Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Niska. Uh, you know, I think this question will best uh, be answered by the lawyers. I'm not a lawyer myself. I think in the language of the provision, uh, we have uh, looked at the language to make sure that a substantial part of any incident has to be relating to uh, bias and hate and motivated. Um, and so I will, t you know, I'm not going to say a yes or no to that question. Um, it is really uh, up to the um, those investigating to decide whether the, there is a stance, substances. <laughs> if whether there is, right. Anyway, uh, it sounds like more of the same, uh, a, a lot of rhetoric going on. What they want to do is make a list of people that disagree with them. That's really what it sounds like. And they want to have this permanent list so that you can constantly uh, be, be chastised one way or another saying, oh, well, this guy's on our bias registry because he said this or she said that. Uh, here to help us make sense of all this is uh, the co-host of Exploring the, the Word on American Family Radio. Uh, he's also the host of the Alex McFarland Show. Guess what, what his name is? Alex McFarland, welcome to the program. It's great to be with you. So let's uh, get into the heart of this, and uh, let's talk about uh, your thoughts on what's going on with this bias registry that's being proposed in Minnesota. Well, it makes me wonder why the Democrats are afraid of free speech, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, I, I know that uh, American government is something somewhat foreign to most Democrats, but we have a little thing called the First Amendment. And, uh, you know, it would pain Democrats to know this, but uh, the Bill of Rights, which comprised the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, uh, include the right to free speech, freedom of expression. And, uh, they, they don't have a constitutional right to subjugate or abridge anyone's free expression of ideas, uh, especially when those ideas are truth backed up with data. And so uh, Minnesotans, I, I hope Minnesotans, uh, regardless of their political stripe, will care enough about our hard-won freedoms to elect people that actually respect the Constitution, something that uh, – Democrats in Minnesota, and I would argue most of the other 49 states uh, don't do. And, and you, I think you raise a good point there in, in um, citing the fact that th there are a number of people, uh, in particular the left within the Democrat Party, that seem to be uh, hell-bent on creating uh, lists, registries, databases of people that they don't agree with, whether it was labeling parents with the threat tag of of uh, being domestic uh, terrorists, of violent domestic yeah. extremists for speaking out at school board meetings, or whatever the disagreement seems to be. It, it, and I find it shocking that we even entertain this type of crazy. What say you? Yeah, I, I mean, look, we are not fascist. Um, I'm a conservative, but I'm not afraid of the expression of any ideas. As long as the, the playing field is level enough that we can rationally discuss and help people find truth. Uh, my goodness, Thomas Jefferson said that error alone needs the support of government. Truth can freely stand on its own. And the fact, whether it be uh, transgenderism, the origins of the COVID virus, uh, you know, any of these things, uh, the fact that the, the woke progressive left has to, uh, you know, subsidize error, suppress truth, tells me that their, their worldview is flawed, not to mention unconstitutional. How do you think we, um, we approach fixing a problem like this? Well, 
You know, for one thing, I, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I, I wouldn't have said this probably, you know, five years ago, but, but I am firmly convinced that a big part of the problem with our country right now, and, and I, look, I kid you not, I, I'm r- routinely in communication with sociologists, historians, elected officials, um, clergy and faith leaders of every stripe. Um, and let me say what I'm about to what I'm about to say is not because I'm a conservative or a Christian conservative or a, an author. I, I'm telling you what I'm hearing from all quarters, really, except liberal, woke, socialist, Marxist, Democrats. Um, part of the big problem are public schools because public schools have become indoctrination centers to generate compliant little socialists. And I'm going to say uh, part of the you know, solution, we've got to be in this for the long haul, but moms and dads have got to get your kids out of public schools. Now, whether it's homeschooling, classical education, private schooling, Christian schooling, but uh, the teachers' unions and activists and textbook publishers – I mean, we've got textbooks that are just um, basically propaganda pieces for Marxist, anti-American, anti-constitutionalist, 1619 Project, bashing America. Uh, the public schools have become basically indoctrination camps. And, and kids, you know, I love kids. My wife and I have been involved in you know, working with children and youth for three decades. But kids, they just don't know. I mean, they, they don't know our history. They've never seen America uh, at her best in a, when patriotism and our you know, constitutional representative republic was valued. And so, uh, you know, I, because I care about America and I care about where I'm going to live until I die, we've got to care enough about our country to um, help people understand what a blessing it is to live in this free, safe, prosperous America And I'll summarize by saying a big part of our solution is we've got to woke-proof our kids. We've got to woke-proof American youth. Really well said, Alex McFarland. Thank you for weighing in on that. I think it's one of the the hot-button issues uh, that we face today, and uh, I appreciate you coming on to tell us about it. Thanks again. Hey, thanks. You bet. Now, folks, Joe Biden is uh, speaking of teachers that we just talked about. Joe Biden's offering a five hundred thousand dollar grant for teachers in Pakistan to help them with transgender youth. Thank you, Joe Biden, for giving away half a million dollars to teachers in Pakistan to help with transgender youth. More on that straight ahead. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, America, welcome back. So I I mentioned this story before we left, and uh, I I find it very, very interesting. Listen to this. This is in uh, thedailyfetched.com. And Joe Biden's offering a $500,000 grant for teachers in Pakistan to help with transgender youth. According to the State Department grant, it will teach English language skills to Pakistani transgender youth so they better participate in the global community and prepare them for success in the workplace. The grant uh, aims to um, focus on three components. Number one, professional development for English language teachers for non-mainstream institutions. Number two, professional development for novice Pakistani English language teachers. And number three, professional development for transgender youth for Afghan teachers, students, and young professionals residing in Pakistan. And uh, this was initially reported by Fox News that the program component that includes a focus on transgender youth accepts proposals from applicants 
for a minimum of $25,000 and a maximum of $75,000 to actually implement. Number one, intensive professional development courses. Uh, and the other two areas that I mentioned, the uh, intensive professional development for Afghan teachers and uh, for those um, with uh, courses for transgender youth ages 13 to 25. Now, these components aim to improve English language <clears throat> and communication skills and connect trainees to a professional alumni network. Teachers participating in the program will share what they learned in these training programs with English language professional colleagues, thereby, thereby influencing pedagogy in their schools and communities. And the article goes on, and maybe I'll share this just because, you know, you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of laughs and giggles when you share stuff like this online. Got to be honest, <laughs> because people can't help but scratch their heads and say, "Hold on a second, why on earth are we giving out a half a million dollars in grants for teachers in Pakistan?" And then you know. You, you look at this and you go, hmm, well, it turns out we do a whole lot of this. We give out a lot of gender studies, this, that, and the other. And we've been doing it for decades upon decades. And in fact, I ha I've had friends that worked in academia. And they would tell me that if people became problematic back in the days, they would say, oh, no, 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 don't worry. We're going to give you a department chairmanship. And they would assign them some obscure thing like women's studies, gender studies, this, that, and the other. Some, just something obscure and, and put them in these departments. Over the years, these, these um, individuals, they took, they took hold of, of these departments and became even bigger and stronger and more influential. And voila, now we have the entire government funding this, not in the United States, which I would be opposed to, funding it in Pakistan, <laughs> not only for Pakistanis, but for Afghans as well. So uh, just absolutely crazy to me. Uh, Kim in Shields, Michigan, what say you? <laughs> it's crazy to me, too. Um, so Biden's going to give five a half million dollars to Pakistan to um, to promote uh, uh, transgenderism. I think I'm not sure, but I think Pakistan is one of those countries in the Middle East that throws those kind of people off the top of roofs. So I think his money's going to get wasted over there. Uh, you know, I just can't believe that he's spreading this filth here and then he's spreading it to other countries too, you know? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely unheard of, unthinkable. It's crazy. And, uh, it's one of those things that I just, I can't figure out and we'll get, uh, we'll get, we'll take some more calls on that as we, uh, proceed. Thank you, Kim, listening on KDKA online. Uh, always appreciate hearing from you. And uh, I wanted to also direct your attention to, uh, an interesting story, uh, that, there's dozens and dozens of uh, international political entertainment headlines covering uh, a lawsuit that's going on between the Heritage Foundation and the Department of Homeland Security over taking them to court. Why? Prince ha Harry's immigration records, right? It's just in time for the coronation this weekend because Prince Harry's admitted to using drugs. And now we don't know if he was in the United States legally or not. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, we're going to get to that straight ahead with Niall Gardner from Heritage. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. America's top conservative think tanks has taken the Biden administration to court over Prince Harry's immigration records and is demanding to know why he's been allowed to stay in the United States when he has admitted to using illegal drugs. Now, my first initial uh, thought would be, didn't he marry an American? Does that kind of qualify him as an American? <laughs> like, can he file for papers? I don't know. Um, I don't know if he ever gave up his British citizenship. I would imagine he didn't. 
being that he's, you know, royalty, even though they don't want him to be royal, he doesn't want to be royalty. I don't understand it, but we are going to bring in an expert to help us understand what is going on with all of this crazy. Is Prince Harry an illegal immigrant in the United States? <laughs> and uh, to help us make sense of this is Niall Gardner. He's a former aide to Margaret Thatcher, and uh, he's a frequent analyst on uh, on the Royals. He's also uh, involved in Heritage's Oversight Project. Niall Gardner, welcome to the program. It's great to be here, uh, Rich. Th thanks very much for having me on the show today. Likewise. Um, I'm happy that you're here because this is an interesting story. We just did a whole big thing on on the uh, immigration crisis that we have at the border. And then we have, you know, just in time for the coronation this weekend of King Charles, uh, we have this story coming uh, with uh, Prince Harry being an illegal alien. Tell us more. Um, well, it's certainly an interesting story with Prince Harry. Uh, so he's not um, actually an illegal alien, but <laughs> yeah, uh, what, <laughs> what, what we are uh, um, asking for at the Heritage Foundation is, is for the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, to release uh, Prince Harry's immigration uh, application, especially in light of his uh, extensive uh, drug use, which he outlined in his own memoir, Spare, which came out uh, in January. Uh, and so we're simply asking for the Biden administration to publicly release the immigration uh, record so that we can see whether or not Harry was actually truthful in terms of his uh, application for a U.S. visa. And also, we want to know whether or not uh, there was special uh, treatment, preferential treatment given to Harry by um, by U.S. Uh, officials. Uh, and, and so uh, we're asking for a transparency, for accountability. Uh, and uh, needless to say, if uh, Harry um, is found to have lied on his uh, U.S. immigration application, that's a very serious offense. Uh, that is perjury. It's a criminal offense. And that usually results in uh, the individual involved being asked to leave the country. Uh, and so the stakes are very high here. Uh, and uh, it's not surprising, it has to be said, that um, so far Harry has not uh, come out supporting the release of his immigration uh, records. Uh, and if he has nothing to hide, of course, he should support the release of, of the immigration application. Uh, and and so so this is really the heart of what we're uh, we're pressing for here. We're pressing for transparency on the part of uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and we're asking for uh, the the U.S. public, the American people, to be able to to see what Harry actually put in his immigration application. So either Prince Harry lied on this application, or he was granted a special favor by somebody from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, basically, yes, I think that's that's the bottom line, because um, if uh, if an individual has extensively used drugs, they have to outline that uh, in detail uh, on their immigration uh, application. Uh, and certainly in Harris case, we know from his memoirs that he uh, was a very extensive user of uh, of drugs. And it's all there in tremendous detail in his in his memoirs. So what he put on his application uh, really, uh, you know, ha ha has to match what is in his memoir, ba basically. Um, now, in many cases where uh, people put down uh, extensive drug use, they are actually denied entry to the United States. Now, there are some exceptions, and in those exceptional cases, uh, senior officials have to grant a, a waiver. Uh, and so, so we, we want to know whether Harry was given some kind of waiver who gave that waiver, what were the, the reasons for doing so, uh, and and also, perhaps most importantly, was, was Harry accurate in terms of the detail that he put down? Because perjury, after all, uh, is an extremely serious offence on an immigration uh, application. Um, and so uh, th there are many, many cases, for example, of British uh, nationals who've been denied entry to the United States uh, and denied visas because of drug use. Uh, so we want to know why, if, if Harry did detail this on his application, why he was granted uh, a waiver for this, and was he given uh, special treatment, uh, and who, who intervened on his behalf, actually, to do so. You know, uh, Niall Gardner, not to conflate anything, but uh, America's first son, Hunter Biden, is also in hot water for lying on a federal application during his time of drug use. And uh, and he's currently under investigation. He might even be charged for this. So it's definitely yeah. something that the government takes seriously. 
And, uh, you know, tongue in cheek, and you don't have to answer that, but I would think, were Harry and Hunter doing drugs together? Is it just the first thing that comes to my mind? Anyway, I want to remind everybody that we're on with Niall Gardner, uh, aide to Margaret Thatcher, and uh, we're discussing the the uh, visa application and renewal uh, and hence uh, and henceforth the subsequent issue of Prince Harry's uh, drug issue and whether or not there was uh, some illegality there. Uh, there's also a poll from Newsweek that I want to get your reaction to straight ahead when we come back. Plus, I want to give out the phone number. If you have a question for Niall Gardner, or you'd like to chime in on this uh, topic, 833-4-VALDES is the phone number, 833-482-5337. Don't move a muscle. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. is Rich Valdez. Now, according to Newsweek.com, half of Americans want Prince Harry's visa reviewed after his admission of drug use. More than half of Americans believe that Prince Harry's visa should be reviewed by the Department of Homeland Security in light of his admission of drug use and experimentation in his memoir, despite a similar number saying that he was right to include it and that the... uh, That's the result of the poll. Now, the poll was undertaken exclusively for Newsweek by Redfield and Wilton and shows that 54 percent of U.S. adults from a sample of 1,500 registered voters believe that the prince's visa should be reviewed after his admission of recreational drug use. Uh, Asked if, given his admission in his book that he previously consumed drugs, should the prince uh, have an application that was reviewed, Uh, 29 percent of them said no. And 17% said they didn't know, compared with that 54%. Our guest is uh, former aide to Margaret Thatcher, Niall Gardner. So Niall Gardner seems like a plurality of Americans think that, yeah, this is something we should check out. Because I think when it comes to immigration, irrespective of party line and things like that, I think people have relatives, friends, neighbors, somebody somewhere that had to go through the visa process that was a, a, a a participant in legal immigration. And everybody ultimately, I think, has an innate sense of fairness where they say, look, you you got to wait your turn. You got to do things the right way. When my aunt, my grandmother, my neighbor, my so-and-so came here, everybody had to do the right thing and, and wait and get a sponsor and do whatever. And this Prince guy is no different. Uh, and that, that really is the heart of the matter here, that everyone should be treated equally before the law. No one should be treated uh, differently and harry just because he's a prince uh doesn't deserve any special favors here uh and uh the newsweek poll i think is very interesting because it illustrates uh the fact that uh you know large number of americans are following this issue uh they uh, most most americans are, are aware of of the fact that harry is living in the united states in california uh, and this poll shows that a majority of americans want to see the release of Harry's immigration records. And so uh, that's, that's a very significant number here. Um, and immigration uh, issues, immigration security, uh, th- these are important matters to the American people. Uh, and uh, the immigration process, of course, the legal immigration process, is very, uh, it's very rigorous, it's very tough. Uh, and it can take years and years for uh, someone to legally acquire a visa, yet Harry seemed to sail through uh, no doubt the result of some kind of, of um, uh, you know, fast-track process. Uh, and so this is a matter of fairness. And the Newsweek poll shows that Americans really do care about this, this sort of issue. And Harry has become a hugely high-profile figure in America, uh, just as he is in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's also become, I have to say, a very unpopular figure in the U.S. Uh, he's a deeply unpopular figure in Britain now, according to opinion polls, and uh, his wife, Meghan Markle, I think, is even more unpopular than Harry, So, uh, which is saying a lot. Uh, so, like, you know, it so sounds Harry like you're is, describing um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, <laughs> it, it's a good point, because Harry and Meghan are increasingly political activists. I would describe them as very sort of woke, left-wing political activists. 
uh, and and they've become part and parcel of the American, uh, you know, political uh, scene in, in many respects. And they are idolized by uh, you know, big celebrity figures on, on the left. Um, and, and I do think that, you know, if ordinary Americans looking at Meghan and Harry, um, you know, most Americans think that, uh, you know, they, they should be treated just like anybody else, actually. Uh, and, and that includes Harry's uh, immigration uh, status. Uh, so we, we are talking here about, I think, two of the most unpopular celebrities, actually, of the modern era, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan, Meghan Markle. And the American public wants to see accountability, transparency and scrutiny, uh, frankly, of, of Harry's immigration application. And, and I think it, the timing doesn't help that we've had um, articles of impeachment brought against uh, Secretary Mayorkas, Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. Uh, we have yeah. a constant crisis at the border that even e- earlier today, we played a clip of audio from CNN and CNN is not known for being a conservative activism network. But uh, they were saying it's an absolute disaster in El Paso, Texas, the things that are occurring there. Uh, we, we've seen the murder of, of a whole family or half of a family, including a nine-year-old child, uh, be- because of uh, failed immigration policies at the border. And with all of that happening, it, it's not a good look, I think, when you're the Secretary of Homeland Security and people are asking questions. And more than half of Americans think that you're doing political favors for Prince Harry, who nobody even likes. Yeah, that's a great point. I think uh, Mayorkas, um, the um, Secretary of Homeland Security, has been absolutely useless, really. Uh, and uh, uh, and I think that the track record of the Biden presidency on immigration matters is absolutely appalling. Uh, huge numbers of illegal migrants have, uh, have come into the country under President Biden. Uh, if Biden was a leader in Europe, he'd be out of office because uh, there would be such a huge backlash against against this. Uh, and, and I think that, um, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, you have you know, de facto a kind of open border on the southern border. Uh, and immigration enforcement is, a, is an issue that the vast majority of, of American people feel strongly about. Uh, and, and that brings back to the Prince Harry issue, really, uh, in that, you know, no one should be able to, um, you know, get, get get away with any form of dishonesty in, in terms of their uh, immigration applications. No one should be treated differently or given special uh, treatments. Uh, and I think that as the Newsweek poll shows, a majority of Americans care about this issue and they want to see the rule of law enforced. Niall Gardner is director of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. And uh, we're going to get to your calls and more. And just a reminder, at the top of the hour, we've got Open Phone America, where we take calls from all across the country. That's coming up. 8334-VALDEZ is the number. And Niall Gardner, stick with us. I want to uh, learn a little bit more about what the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom is, what you do, and what it was like to be an aide to Margaret Thatcher. So stick with us. Don't move a muscle. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Rich Valdez, who again will do a fine job, but I know you'll enjoy listening to him. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. All right, I see the calls are already starting to come in. Uh, We're going to get those screened and get those up so we can get to you momentarily. Our guest is Niall Gardner. He's on Twitter, at Niall Gardner. That's N-I-L-E-G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R. And uh, Niall Gardner is the director of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom and was an aide to Margaret Thatcher. Niall Gardner, tell us what it was like to work for Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I had the the privilege of working for Lady Thatcher in a private office. uh, Actually, uh, about a decade or so after she was uh, she was prime minister, but she was still very politically active. Mm -hmm. Uh, She was, uh, in my view, a fantastic uh, boss to have uh, a highly uh, principled and courageous uh, political leader. 
uh, who was also uh, somebody who took uh, great care of her, her own staff. Uh, and it was very, uh, I would have to say, exciting working for such a, a high profile, distinguished figure. Uh, but at the same time, she was somebody who, who I, I thought was a very kind uh, boss to have uh, and, and a woman of always tremend tremendous uh, principle, really. Uh, somebody who lived her life for, uh, for the sake of the British people uh, and who left, um, I think, an incredible uh, legacy, actually. I mean, she defeated socialism in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, she took on the, uh, the far left uh, Labour Party and won. She won three a successive uh, general election. She never lost a, a general election. Actually, she was ousted really in a coup within her own Conservative Party, but she never lost an election. And together with Ronald Reagan, of course, she uh, faced down the might of the Soviet Empire and won. Uh, so her achievements are legendary. Uh, I don't think we'll ever see someone quite like Margaret Thatcher again. Uh, and uh, working for her was, was just an incredible uh, honour, really. And uh, I was very fortunate to have worked with her on uh, her final book, uh, Statecraft, uh, which um, was her big, big picture foreign policy uh, vision that was published in 2002. It also became the genesis of Brexit as well. And she called in a book for, uh, for the British people to uh, seriously consider leaving the European Union, which is exactly what happened uh, in the referendum vote in 2016. So she was always decades ahead of her time. Uh, and uh, she was, in, in many respects, uh, you know, a very forward-looking, quite revolutionary uh, thinker, uh, and, and she changed the course of history. Niall Gardner, what would you say is the number one piece of advice uh, or the number one thing you learned from Margaret Thatcher in your time working with her? Yeah, I think that most important thing really... Um, from working for for her was the importance of of standing up for principle. Uh, she was a conviction politician, uh, and she did everything out of a you know fundamental belief in uh, in in conservative uh, principles. And so uh, she she lived her life really as as a, a very a principled individual. Uh, and and I think that's the most important lesson from working for her. She was someone who who really followed what she believed in, and she, she practiced her life based upon her, her beliefs. Uh, and she was unwavering uh, in, in pursuing that. And she was never one for, you know, for spin or blowing with a political wind. You knew exactly what Margaret Thatcher stood for and believed in. There are very few politicians like that today, actually, if you think about it, um, mm. uh, with, with that kind of set of principles and, and the tremendous courage that she had. So uh you know that that for me was the most important point i mean there's so many i think sure. you know less to be learned from her but, but that, that was the most important i think and um in the, we have about a minute to go with um with a final thought to you tell us uh, as director now of the margaret thatcher center for freedom at heritage um tell us about the work that you're doing and uh, you know the the body of work that that uh, encompasses the center well, we focus on uh, U.S.-U.K. relations, the, the uh, special relationship, but also on helping to shape U.S. policy on, on Europe. Uh, we focus on NATO. Uh, we also uh, cover the United Nations and national sovereignty issues in the defense of U.S. national sovereignty. Uh, and we also publish the annual Index of Economic Freedom. Uh, and to add, add to that as well, uh, we are, of course, um, working on the Prince Harry um, uh, in immigration uh, request issue as well, which is, which is important for us. So uh, we're working on multiple fronts at this time. Outstanding. Well, Niall Gardner, I'd love to have you back to, to get your take on this uh, attack, uh, pseudo attack, false flag, reality, whatever, on the Kremlin and whether Ukraine had anything to do with it. But until then, I want to thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, very enlightening. You got it. From the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at night 
with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? This is the Wednesday night edition of America at Night with me, Rich Valdez, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Our telephone number, if you want to join this late night national town hall forum, please feel free to give us a call, 833-482-5337. Of course, you can always reach us on the legacy line, 866-50-JIMBO, R-I-P Jimbo, and um, that's 833-4-VALDEZ. Uh, if you look at it alphanumerically. And <clears throat> a few things I want to go over. We're going to open up the phones momentarily for your calls. We're also going to go over a few headlines and uh, a couple of clips of audio. But I wanted to um, just recap a little bit of what we did tonight because we had some really interesting guests. We had um, a, the um, gentleman who was from the Margaret Thatcher Center at Heritage who was suing the Department of Homeland Security over the... Um, impropriety with uh, Prince Harry's visa application. Uh, we also had a tremendous discussion with Mark Morgan, former Obama border chief and then uh, commissioner uh, of CBP under Trump. Uh, long time, decades long public servant, uh, given us the skinny on what was going on. We talked about the shooting in Atlanta. There was some breaking news on that, that they've caught the shooter. We also talked about the, the, um, what was it? The, Members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, uh, Chuck Grassley and uh, Chairman Comer, going after the, bri the Biden crime family over this Biden bribery scheme that has been emerging. And we'll get into that a little bit in the, in the next segment. Uh, and also whether Hunter Biden is going to be charged or not. Plus, there's been an attack on the Kremlin. And uh, we discussed that. My thoughts are that it's probably fake, phony fraud. Uh, but Maybe I'm wrong, you know, so I'll take your co your comments on that. And anything else that you want to comment on is uh, open uh, to 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 being on the table here. Uh, I'm game for that. So uh, 833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number. A couple of headlines here. The Federal Reserve has hiked interest rates another quarter point. So if you thought that, you know, going for a car loan or a mortgage and uh, or even a new credit card and uh, thought the rates were high, today they're going up another quarter point. Uh, then, of course, we have the IRS. This is a really fascinating story to me. The IRS has spent $10 million on weapons since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic began. Now, this one I find particularly interesting because my initial reaction is, you know, there's the Federal Protective Service. There's uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. There's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. There's the Federal Parks Police. I mean, there's so many federal law enforcement agencies, not the least of which is the IRS. I've never considered the IRS to be a law enforcement entity. And it's not like the post office that has their own police department, the United States Postal Police. The IRS doesn't have that, but apparently they're amassing weapons and they're trying to hire agents that have the ability to shoot and kill people. I'm not making that up. You could do all the research on that that you want. And uh, it was Republicans in Congress led by McCarthy that uh, put the kibosh on that for, for now. But not, not good, right? No bueno. Anyway, the Internal Revenue Service was um, spending millions of dollars stocking up on guns, ammunition, and combat gear since 2020. According to the findings uh, by Open the Books Foundation, the, the agency spent a total of $10 million on weaponry and gear since the COVID-19 pandemic began, including $2.3 million on duty ammunition, $1.2 million on ballistic shields, and another $1.3 million on various other gear for criminal investigation agents. <clears throat> wow. Uh, additionally, the agency spent $474,000 on Smith & Wesson rifles, $463,000 on Beretta 1301 tactical shotguns, and $243,000 on body armor, uh, in particular vests, since 2020. Another $467,000 was reportedly spent on tactical lighting, 
$354,000 on gear bags and $267,000 on ballistic helmets at the same time as the other purchases. The report is called The Militarization of Federal Bureaucracy, and it contains updated data through the end of March 2023. Now, since 2006, the IRS has splashed out 300, no, I'm sorry, $35.2 million adjusted for inflation on guns, ammunition, and military styled equipment. The report found that 2020 and 2021 saw them. Uh, increase these spends dramatically. This is a report uh, right now in the Epic Times. I'll share it on social media at Rich Valdez with an S so that you could take a look at it. But my question to you is, why on earth do we need to arm the IRS? I mean, if they needed law enforcement support, can't they turn to the FBI? Can't they turn to even criminal investigators that are within the IRS to work with others? Um, do we need to increase the size? Do we need more government? Do we need a more armed government in the IRS to collect taxes? Now, the reason I asked this is because a couple of years back, uh, it was probably February of when, when COVID hit, right around that time, right? It was February of 2020. And I remember I was a substitute uh, for Mark Levin on the Mark Levin show. And I was speaking with a caller and I want to say he was from one of the Scandinavian countries or maybe from Amsterdam. Uh, but he was in the United States, but he was born there. And he called in and we were talking about taxes and whatnot. And he said, let me tell you something about, uh, you know, when Bernie was, I had played a clip of Bernie Sanders, you know, where he, he says, Denmark, Denmark, terrific, best spending ever, you know, that type of thing. And um, saying, you know, how great their taxation was and how it was, everything was free and they taxed everybody at 60%. And, and this guy called in to say, look, you know, they, they tax you at 60%. And he's like, just imagine six, you know, six bucks out of every 10 going to the government so they can have all this quote unquote free stuff. And he goes on to tell us about how, you know, he'd moved to the United States and, and, and loved it here, but he'd go back to visit his mom. And in one of his trips to visit his mom, he was at the airport and he said he was hanging out there waiting for his plane. And this small army comes in tactical gear up the wazoo he described it as a SWAT team he said they were wearing black you couldn't see their faces they had combat boots and helmets on and big rifles and they came in and swiftly surrounded a man and grabbed him and he said when he got a closer look these were tax collectors and the guy was trying to leave the country while he had an open tax bill meaning he was trying to go back to the United States or go to the United States, uh, you know, for a visit, vacation, whatever it was. And they would not allow him to leave the country without paying his tax bill first, because that's how strict enforcement of taxes is in this particular country. And I don't know, remember the country. Um, if you want to do the homework on it, you could research one of my fill-ins for Levin and listen to that story and, and the caller, you know, his firsthand account of it. But fascinating to me on the aggressive nature that they use in these countries to get that tax money. And it makes me think, you know, again, that was 2020. Here we are in 23, headed towards 2024. And voila, we're looking at the same situation here in the U.S. Now the U.S. is trying to gear up and have their own SWAT team in the IRS where they wanted to have you know, these uh, $80 million or whatever it was and have 80,000 um, new agents armed with the ability to shoot people and whatnot. And again, that's from the job description that was on the uh, USA Jobs website. So this is, for me, something we've got to look at and say, hold on a second. I even, Lito, we got a problem here, right? So I want to get your opinions on that as well, 833-4-VALDEZ. And I want to take this moment because although this is the Wednesday night edition, uh, here on the East Coast, it's already after midnight. It's 12.15 in the morning, which makes it officially Thursday, May 4th. And May 4th, yes, is my birthday eve because my birthday is Cinco de Mayo. But my brother from another, his name is Richard Cementa, also known as Mr. Producer from the Mark Levin Show, my partner in crime when I was Mr. Call Screener and he was Mr. Producer. Today's his birthday. Not only do we share the same first name and we're both married to women named Jennifer, interestingly, uh, but we also almost share a birthday. So happy birthday to Mr. Producer and uh, wish you many, many, many more. Anyway, don't go anymore. Uh, don't go anywhere because there's more to come straight ahead with your calls and more. 833 4 Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now. 833 
for Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 4 valdez That's Valdez with an S. I want to listen to you, Rich, all the time. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, so an investigation has found that 10-year-old children have been working unpaid at several McDonald's restaurants owned by independent franchisees. This is a big deal. It's a big violation of child labor laws. And there's a report from WDRB. Listen to this. Companies that run McDonald's restaurants in our area are accused of overworking young children, including letting 10-year-olds work in the kitchen. The U.S. Department of Labor investigated Louisville-based Bauer Food, the Bell Restaurant Group, and Archway's Richwood out of Walton. All three operate dozens of McDonald's in Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, and Maryland. The agency found more than 300 children worked more than the legally permitted hours, some of them past 2 a.m. Two 10-year-olds worked in the kitchen without pay, one of them handling a deep fryer. All three companies are now facing civil penalties and totaling more than $212,000. So, uh, needless to say, look, I wanted to work not when I was 10, but, you know, when I was like 13, 14, you know, I had to wait till I was 16. Actually, I waited till I was about 15. My mom knew somebody at a Dunkin' Donuts and they were, they were willing to take me at 15 without like working papers through my school. Um, and I was 15. It was, you know, months away, like maybe eight or nine months away uh, from, from my 16th birthday. But 10 years old? Now, if you've got 10-year-olds that are working, this tells me they probably don't have parents, right? And these are probably 10-year-olds. And I'm just going to guess. I don't have any of the facts on this. This is me guessing. If I'm wrong, you can call me and blow raspberries and go... You are totally wrong, Valdez, but I'll tell you this. I bet you anything, these are 10-year-olds, these unaccompanied minors that are coming over the border, and this is the, um, the, the new wave. People that aren't getting replaced by AI technology in their workplace are going to be using child labor, and this is all happening on Biden's watch. In my opinion, probably by design. Crazy. Absolutely crazy what's going on. Let's go to your phone calls. Frank in Evergreen, Montana, K-O-F-I. Frank, go right ahead. Hi. I just want to talk about the weather out here. It's uh, We're on about fourth day now of really high temperatures. and uh, the snow What's mountain. really high in, in Montana? Oh, the... Like 90? The temperatures. It's, no, but I mean like 90 degrees, 90. 85 degrees? Yeah, in that that range and uh, yeah, wow. So you're having like Florida weather. It's it's like I I predicted at the beginning of the year that we're not, we're not going to see a spring anymore. It's just going to go from winter to summer, and we're we're not probably going to see a fall either. It's just it's a different type of climate, and I think it has yeah. a lot to do with the uh, in the northern part of Canada. There's a company called Rio Tinto, and they're doing this. It's an international company, uh, several different nations that are doing this open pit mining, and they, they drill down below the clay level and and getting into the core heat of the earth and releasing heat, and that kind of diverts the jet streams towards the Pacific or back to the East Coast, but, not, but the Rockies aren't getting it enough moisture as normal and so it's, it's fascinating uh, you, you know uh frank in china uh, i learned this uh doing a story covering this this uh for a segment that we did on on the olympics when they were in china a couple of years ago and that the chinese have a very uh robust what they call weather modification program and when the olympics were there they created some artificial snow not like they do at the ski slopes but they like made it snow, like they created clouds that had precipitation and it snowed. And uh, at least that was my understanding of it. And they were bragging that saying, you know, our weather modification program is, you know, second to none. We're doing great. And in the United States, we have a similar program, but it doesn't get the, the type of um, 
uh, publicity that the Chinese had. And we're not as proud of ours as they are of theirs. I think um, we spend more time saying we don't do things to change the weather. Uh, and instead, we blame all of the the climate change on the flatulence of cows and you and me driving vehicles that use gasoline rather than battery power. And, and I just think the whole thing is crazy personally. But um, with that being said, speaking of crazy, uh, what, what do you make of this story of 10 year olds working at McDonald's? Well, I was bucking bales at uh, 14 years old, but no, I wouldn't want to, be working at 12 years old in in, in the kitchen. That's pretty bad. Yeah, I agree. And that's actually what the, um, the investigation where they, they were fined several hundred thousands of dollars. They, um, ultimately said, look, we should not have 10 year olds near deep frying machines as hot as they get or the ovens that we have. It's just not the environment for a 10 year old. And, uh, we'll continue to look at that story. Frank, thank you for your call. Um, let us continue here with uh what's this tom in south carolina charleston south carolina wtma tom welcome yes sir how you doing wonderful thank you we got great we got great weather here 70s in the daytime low 50 uh, high 50s at nighttime it's going to be that way for another week so anybody Beautiful. that wants a vacation come on down Look, i love uh, south carolina and north carolina great weather all the time yeah, it's beautiful. Charleston is just beautiful. Listen, uh, what you just said about the migrants working, that's the truth. And that leads right into what I wanted to talk about. Susan Rice, mm-hmm. the uh, puppeteer master that's telling Joe Biden everything to do. Have you heard that she's resigning and the reason why she is resigning? Yeah, well, I know that she announced that she'd uh, she quit her job. Uh, the day before, the evening before, Biden announced his reelection campaign video. <laughs> and um, I, we don't know. Um, I, I don't know why she's done it. What, what are your thoughts? Well, this is what she says herself. It's not my thought. She says it herself. She can't take what's happening to the kids, to the 300,000 kids. It's starting to bother her. Now we'll get uh, I haven't heard anything on that. I, I can't corroborate that one. Yeah. Um, I'll try well, and find some I'll audio on that. But uh, if we find it, we'll play it. I, I can't really. I, I know that from what I've seen, she hasn't said anything. And uh, I'd love to, to see that audio. I'll actually put you back on with our producer. And maybe you could direct him on to where we could find that. That would be uh, terrific. But thank you for your call, Tom. I appreciate it. It's uh it's some people are speculating that she's running for president. Uh, some are saying she's going to be the next vice president. Others are saying she's going to launch Michelle Obama's campaign. I don't think any of that stuff is true. Uh, maybe she'll work with, with the Biden campaign. Um, that would make the most sense. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I've never take, t- taken her to be uh, that much of a retail level politician where she's front and center. But we'll see how it goes. Anyway, the rest of your calls are coming up. I see we got calls from Missouri, calls from Ohio, and more coming in. So don't move a muscle. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back with your calls. Plus, there is a campaign for transgender recruitment in the United States military. We're going to get you a clip on that and discuss that as well. 833-4-VALDEZ. It's Open Phone America. So the United States military is under fire. They're taking some heat because of uh, controversial advertising campaigns for recruitment. Looking at a story here, critics are exploding over the U.S. U.S. Navy's use of a drag queen to solve their recruiting crisis, (laughs) saying, here's what you shouldn't do. Yeoman second class Joshua Kelly goes by the stage name Harpy Daniels. And uh, 
Critics lambasted the United States Navy on Wednesday over its use of a drag queen influencer to help persuade new recruits to join the military amid a massive recruitment crisis. Now, this news broke uh, earlier in the day where second uh, yeoman second class Joshua Kelly, who, like I said, goes by the name Harpy Daniels and identifies as non-binary, was a digital ambassador in the Navy's pilot program to attract these new recruits. So in effect, you've got Harpy Daniels, the Navy's new digital ambassador, you know, representing the United States Navy, a drag queen. Who do you think this is going to appeal to? So is that what we're trying to do? Create a, an entire military of drag queens? I mean, I just don't understand the logic there. What is the benefit? What is the purpose? Um, the uh, revelation set off explosive reactions from lawmakers and former members of the United States military alike. And as I'm looking at a picture here of him, and I saw the video earlier on the news, um, but not good. This is, um, you know, you got Representative Jim Banks saying that woke partisan officials are projecting weakness abroad and divisiveness at home. The recruitment shortage is a serious crisis that we must address with serious solutions. TikTok videos of drag queens are just making a bad problem worse. I think uh, Congressman Jim Banks is right. A staff member for Banks told uh, Fox News that the congressman reached out to the Navy over Mr. Kelly's account in March, but never heard anything back. And uh, looks like they're continuing to use the drag queen as part of their recruitment. Uh, then you have uh, Dan Crenshaw, he's a former Navy SEAL representative from Texas. He says maybe the Navy should talk to Bud Light Marketing and exchange notes about what not to do. <laughs> Good point. And uh, uh, he's obviously talking about the recent controversy with the beer brand and the use of a transgender personality known as Dylan Mulvaney. So I think they know exactly what they're doing, and they know that if you use this transgender influencer as your new Navy guy, guess what happens to your Navy? The same thing that happened to Bud Light. We don't have a Navy. So then we're no longer in the running. It's funny. I was just talking about this today with my buddy from the Cuban restaurant, telling him how it, it's my opinion that it's a mixture of people that are just pacifists that don't care about building up the United States military. And they're willing to take military funding and slash it and slash it. So they could fund lots of other pet socialism projects. And then there's others that really want to gut the American military and don't want this to be uh, filled with people that love the red, white, and blue, that love the country, but rather that are culture warriors for one side of the aisle, if you will. And this is problematic. Now, the United States Army also has a similar ad campaign. It's a cartoon. And in the cartoon, you've got a young woman, which I'm going to identify her as a young woman. She claims that she has two moms and that one mom became ill and she tells a little bit of a story on how that led her to joining the United States Army. Listen to this. When I was six years old, one of my moms had an accident that left her paralyzed. Doctors said she might never walk again. But she tapped into my family's pride to get back on her feet, eventually standing at the altar to marry my other mom. With such powerful role models, I finished high school at the top of my class. Now, she didn't stop there. She went on. Listen to this. One of my sorority sisters was studying abroad in Italy. Another was climbing Mount Everest. I needed my own adventures, my own challenge. And after meeting with an army recruiter, I found it. A way to prove my inner strength and maybe shatter some stereotypes along the way. Well, there you have it, folks. That's the, the our American military. This is their latest recruitment campaign. And uh, using a, a drag queen influencer for the Navy, using this cartoon of this young lady, and I don't know if the story's real or not. I presume it is real. And they used that story and dr dramatized it for this cartoon. But I all I could say is I'm looking at a quote from Sean Parnell who's a combat veteran, he, he ran for the United States Senate, and uh, he says, the Navy's using a drag queen to boost sinking recruitment numbers and wondering why numbers are in the tank. The woke BS is destroying our military. Uh, he goes on to say, I'm sure China, Iran, and Russia are all shaking in their boots right now. And, and that's uh, um, comedian Tim Young 
uh, also adding that instead of strong, seafearing military uh, men and women, Biden is converting this to a gay cruise line. And uh, I can't help but think that's funny, but really sad at the same time. So that's where we are right now. That's where we are. The the um, United States military is using, uh, and again, is this a horrible thing? I'm guessing their argument would be, well, you know, for years we've used Hispanic soldiers to reach out to the Hispanic community for recruitment in, in those communities or with African-Americans or we've used women to recruit more women. So why not use uh, a drag queen or, you know, the, the product of someone that was brought up by two moms? And, and, and this would be their, their push for diversity and equity and inclusion. And my thought would be, do we necessarily promote, I joined the, the army because of my mom and dad. We might. There might be, you know, stories, testimonials out there of people that say, you know, my mom and my dad got married in the military and their mom and dad met in the military. And I come from a long line of people that have served this country. But I, I would say that that story has a lot more to do with America, that has a lot more to do with, with service to the country than the story that we just heard. And I don't think I'm being uh, unfair. Uh, I think it was a very inspiring story for, for, you know, if you were giving a speech on, on Women's Day, International Women's Day, if you were giving a speech on, on, on a pro-gay marriage speech, uh, it, to me, it just didn't seem like an inspiring speech to join the military. I got nothing out of it as to why this person should, you know, defend the country. It doesn't mean that they won't. I'm not questioning their patriotism. I'm questioning, I'm questioning the, the sense of using this as a marketing tool. Anyway, I'd love your thoughts and comments on this. 833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number. 833, the number 4, Valdez. We'll be right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. So some people are worried about losing their jobs because of artificial intelligence. And it turns out that we've got artificial, artificial, take two. We've got artificial intelligence that is going to replace a number of people uh, at IBM, it seems. And we're going to get to that in a moment. But I want to go to your calls uh, because we have a few people on the line. We got uh, from KMA in Iowa. She's on the road in Missouri. Samantha, welcome. You're on with Rich Valdez. Go right ahead. Hey there. I was just um, I agree with what you were saying with the Bud Light um, transgender mm -hmm. movement trying to go across, you know, America. Every little thing is they them. And, you know, I, I'm a mother and I'm I'm a she I'm I'm a mom. I'm a woman. And I, my my boys are boys. Um, and that's OK. Right. I mean, it's OK to be whatever. But, you know, What's wrong with it's like oh I'm come, I'm from Washington State and it's like there it's almost what's wrong with being a traditional person you know a traditional family right and having values yeah it's a shame to see where where we're at today Samantha where. Uh, it used to be, you know, the, the left constantly preached about tolerance and, oh, you have to tolerate this and tolerate that, include this. And, and then as people did that and said, all right, look, hey, if you want to do your thing, do your thing. But now that's not enough. Now it's if you're not that, then you must be a, a, a valiant ally. And and it, it almost seems it's like, you know, what's wrong with you for being straight? What's wrong with you for marrying, uh, you know, someone of the opposite sex? <laughs> why, why aren't you telling your kids that they should become, you know, gender fluid? And, and to me, that's the assault, right? That's the problem, this affront on the family, the, uh, this uh, attack on traditionalism that I think people just, they're, they're not having it. 
I don't know anybody, even my own children. I talk to them about this and they say, look, if kids in school want to do whatever they want to do, that's on them. Uh, but I don't need anybody telling me that I need to be doing this, that, or the other, Samantha. Right. And it, it and I, like my husband said, he thinks it's, per, you know, it, it is purposeful to break America apart for people who hate America, hate our traditions and, um, you know, our freedoms and morals. Yeah. hundred percent. I agree with you. And, uh, uh, thankful for your call. Big shout out to you and your husband and everybody that's in Missouri and uh, at KMA in Iowa. Thank you, Samantha, for the call. Much appreciated. Uh, let's continue with your calls. Uh, let's go to GW. GW called in the other night. And I, I called on you and you were gone, so I'm glad you called in. Galesburg, Illinois, WGIL. Go right ahead. Uh, good evening. Thanks for taking my call. I was uh, yes, sir. wanting to weigh in on the uh, I was wanting to weigh in. I got a couple of things I wanted to weigh in on the idea of recruitment. One of them is that when I went in the Marine Corps, I went in there for uh, three basic reasons. Number one, at that time in history, people were kind of patriotic and they stood up for their country. But I also was looking at the idea that I come from a poor family and that my military service would provide me with health care if I needed it later in life, and an education, which I knew me or my family could not afford. I was able to parlay that education, and I now have two master's degrees, one in uh, criminal justice, one in sociology, and that's provided me with a, a, a good living. I, I teach now. I teach anthropology, sociology, and criminal justice. So I don't think they've not. I don't think they've quit that benefit. I think you still get the GI Bill if you serve. But I'm thinking, what about people that's already went to school? There's all this talk about uh, canceling student debt or whatever. What if the military said, you know, if you serve four years, we will take care of your student debt? It wouldn't be any different than the GI Bill paying for it, like it did for me. And it yeah. might be an incentive for people to get in there. Yeah, not a bad idea. I mean, I would suspect that most people that um, uh, I think it's an excellent idea. And my suspicion would just be that most people that that are interested in the military had that interest before going to college and um, did so. But you're right. I think there might be some people that said, hey, I'm going to go to law school and get an undergrad degree, get a law degree and then realize, you know, I don't want to practice law, but I would like to be a, a you know, a, a, a JAG in the military, judge, advocate general and be a military lawyer. Um, makes a lot of sense to me that that they would, uh, you know, extend them that that same courtesy because they would if they signed up right out of high school saying I want to go for this and that and they'd pay for all eight years of school. So I think it's a it's a brilliant point, and I hope somebody who's in charge of that stuff is listening to you, GW in Galesburg, Illinois, on WGIL, because I think it's an excellent point. Thank you for your service to the country, and thanks for your phone call. Uh, let us continue. Uh, let's go to our unofficial historian here on America at Night with Rich Valdez, Bill in Jefferson City, Missouri, KTTR. Bill, go. Thank you, uh, Rich. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about Margaret Thatcher. Lady Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady who came to Missouri, mid-Missouri, Westminster College, in 1996. And then I believe she died in 2013. So there's been some really nice articles on her, and the Churchill Museum has saved some of her speeches there. And I went and looked at them again, and uh, I found them worth worthwhile doing so if anybody wanted to google margaret thatcher 1996 you get the churchill museum and uh, you learn her story fascinating i I, i'll definitely check it out because uh, i thought it was really uh, enlightening when we had the conversation with niall gardner earlier who was um, an aide of hers and uh, when he told me what he'd learned from her i said you know what Uh, i I once read a biography years ago kind of skimmed through it and it wasn't the most exciting biography, but I think I, it's probably high time I check out another one, which um, is a little bit <clears throat> more um, succinct, where I could learn a little bit more about her and probably written by somebody who had a better uh, understanding or authority on on her life and her leadership. Uh, because definitely a historical figure, and I try to learn as much as I can from those types of figures. So 
I think uh, your your neighbors in Missouri uh, are smart and very wise to um, to memorialize her visit the way they have at the museum. Bill in Jefferson City, Missouri, our unofficial historian here on the program. Thank you for your call, my brother. Godspeed to you, and shout out to everybody on KTTR. More from you in America, uh, Illinois, Ohio, South Carolina, New Jersey, all coming up next. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. So I wanted to get into this conversation on AI because there's some crazy AI. I'm going to leave it for tomorrow because I want to take my time with it. And I want to make sure I get to all of you guys. But uh, yeah, 6,000 jobs or something like that are going to be replaced by IBM saying that they're going to do that. And then there's a, a study out that says that they're going to hook up AI to the brain of a rat. Man, it's crazy stuff. Uh, I'll I'll share it with you tomorrow. But I want to go to Paul in Zanesville, Ohio, W-H-I-Z. Paul, go right ahead. Uh, good evening, Rich. I've been waiting a while, but um, I changed up what I was going to say a little bit. But go for you it. Know, Biden's a fruit loop. Uh, <laughs> you know, Biden's a fruit loop, just like that Mulvaney. And maybe he's another illegitimate child of uh, of Hunter, you know? <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, he, you know, I can't believe that this guy is going to do this to our military. Look what he's doing for these Pakistani kids. I mean, really? Come on. I, I hope people see him and his family for what they are. And it's all coming out in the wash. And I just love it. Yeah, Outstanding point, Paul. Big shout out to you uh, and everybody in Ohio and WHIZ. Uh, I totally agree with you. And um, let's continue our journey to the other side of the country. Denise in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey on WOND very quickly. Well, yeah, um, I spent uh, 23 years in the Army regarding, um, you know, the gender um, problems that we're having and Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, Anytime there was an issue with um, the gay population in the Army, it was always divisive and the the people in charge always kind of like cut it, cut it short and it was over. Um, there was a, a bunch of gays in the military, male and female, and, um, they were always divisive. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but it happens to be my experience. Yeah. And, and uh, when, when you talk about this division, uh, how did that pan out? Were, were they, um, did they take things out on people that weren't of their persuasion or were they treated differently by the others? Yeah, it was it was a multitude of um, of issues, and for all intents and purposes, most of the uh, outcomes were that they were um, booted out. Yeah, it was always a big deal, and I remember uh, President Clinton was probably one of the first to to really verbalize this type of thing and say, "Hey, look, uh, we're going to use the whole don't ask, don't tell." And at the time, it was a huge deal, but it was the easiest. I don't want to say easiest, the safest policy position for him to take was to say, look, you know, we're not going to ask and you don't have to tell. And it seemed to to allay a lot of people's concerns. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I've seen some interesting Facebook chats between friends of mine that are ex-military and friends of theirs that are gay in the military. And they were taking exception to people that were transgender because they weren't available to fight because they were out of medical because of their sex change surgery. So, Denise, thank you for the call. Uh, That's it for me tonight. Hasta la próxima. Until the next time, America. Take care, good night, and God bless. We're going to do it all again tomorrow. Until then, keep listening to the radio because this is where it's at. Adios. Adios.